Hi, this is Professor Cummings, and this video I'm going to be going over uh, some basic integration. But before we do that, I want to review a uh, derivative. So what we described as a derivative was the slope of a tangent point to a function, or a slope of a tangent point to a curve. So you can see here we've got a function. We've got a, basically a table with a distance versus time. The time is on the independent uh, axis, the x-axis, and the dependent variable is displacement or distance. And if we were to graph this particular function and we wanted to know what a derivative was, we could take a sl uh, tangent point or uh, take a line that's tangent to this function and the point where it intersects, that single point, that instantaneous point, is what would be the instantaneous velocity, the instantaneous uh, distance, and that is the derivative. So the slope of that of that line at that point is the distance over time and that's what gets us the velocity. Now we went through something called the limit method of finding that derivative and what you can see is if we work through that as all this is this is just a, a slope of change in distance or change in height over the change in distance and you notice the distance is just h a single point we were looking at the limit as h approaches zero so, and that's why this was an instantaneous rate of change again like I said that's also known as the derivative if we were to take this same formula and write it in terms of differentials meaning the infinitesimally small increments we would end up with an equation like this instead of distance over time or change in distance over change in time we'd end up with this differential in distance with the differential in time infinitesimally small amount of time and that gets us our instantaneous rate of change or a velocity. So let's keep that in mind that velocity is actually just a derivative of distance. So make note of that as we go on to the same function. And just for the record this function can be described as x squared. So f of x is equal to x squared. You know a little bit of review on derivatives. So now, again, this is just that same function, just written out a lot neater. You know, the f of x is equal to x squared, describes this function, and it is still distance on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. You have an f of x is equal to the y-axis, which is just x squared. That's the function. That You know, again, that ex explains. And all this is is just a graph of the distance versus time. And again, by the definition of what a function is, you know, you have an input and you have an expected output. So f at x, x squared, or f of x is equal to x squared. So the function of x is x squared. So now we did the derivative on that last one with the uh, power rule. Again, this again will be in the description, link in the description box. But, you know, with the power rule, you have. Uh, take a derivative of x squared, you just take the exponent, the current exponent, put it down as a coefficient, which is the 2, and you subtract 1 from that exponent. So you end up with 2x is the derivative of x squared. So this represents the distance, a function of the, or the distance, and this represents the velocity, or a function that describes the velocity. Now if we were to try and take this same velocity, you can see that this turns out just to be an another, even though it's a derivative, all it turns into is another function. So with the same input, at that same point in time, we'll end up with a new, a new output based around the function of 2x. So we end up with this chart here. If we were to plot that graphically, we'd end up with this. Again, that's a derivative is nothing more than a function. And you can actually uh, graph that as just the velocity, you know, versus time. So one is the derivative of the other. And again, you can see the output of that works out. And again, so a derivative is simply a function. It follows all the rules of a function, and you can graph it the same as a function. You can table it the same as a function. So now let's say we were to just get nothing but a function and we wanted to find out where it came from. 
In this case, we have a, a velocity, a function that describes a velocity. Well, we have some basic idea just from physics, like we said before, that the velocity is the, or the instantaneous velocity, is the uh, differential of the distance with respect to time. And I've got x here representing your time. And if you were to multiply your distance times the velocity, or your time times the velocity, you would end up taking us back to the distance. So how does this go back to our function and, you know, going into antiderivatives? Well, let me show you. Let's say you want to look at the, how far an uh, object was going to travel within a certain arbitrary amount of time. You know, so what we can do is we have a window of time. And we have some function that's going to match that time. That's going to give us some idea as to how that, how far that thing has traveled, whatever the object is we're looking at. So what you have here is you've got, you know, a change in amount of time, and you've got a function that relates to that. Now keep in mind this original equation that we I told you about, which is the distance is equal to the velocity times time. So what do you have here in this equation? You've got a velocity, which is a function of x, and you've got a, a time. Well, you take that same rectangle, that same window of time, going to that particular function, and you've got a function of time, or excuse me, a function times the window of time is equal to the distance. And that also represents the area of, the, of that rectangle for that window of time. Now again, this is only a very succinct window of time, a very distinct window of time that we're talking about here. You know, so it only represents a very small arbitrary amount of that whole function. If we wanted to try and find more of that function, we need more windows, you know, those same increments of time that matches up with that particular function. So we can take several different rectangles, you know, put them together within those same even increments, and take them up to the particular function, you know, the function which is, the, you know, where the velocity was at that particular time. And we end up, you know, looking at all these various areas underneath that underneath that curve. And to find if we add them all together, or we take the sum of those independent areas, which is just the function of time, the function times the window of time, you know, the sum of the function, we'd, we'd get an area under the curve, and that would tell us some idea of what that function would be that would better describe what the distance that object is traveling. But you can see here, just from the fact that these are rectangles, you've got all these little gaps and overlaps and imperfections that are going to describe what's going into this particular uh, function and how it relates to one another. So there's, it's not even, it's not accurate, it's a total estimation or a, it's an estimation of what's going on. You know, and it's not a very accurate ex, uh, uh, estimation. So what do we do here? So this is where taking an antiderivative comes up. So what we can do is, just like when we were taking the derivative, we want to look at and imagine that this window of time is no longer so arbitrary. Let's make it smaller and smaller and smaller until we get something that's, again, is infinitesimally small in terms of how much time we think. If we did that, we'd have a much more accurate amount of, you know, much more accurate estimation for how, what that displacement is, that function that's going to describe our displacement our distance. What it also means is that we're going to have to take an infinite number of those triangles, or an infinite number of those rectangles. So we're not going to be able to just to sum those up. We're going to need another symbol. And that's where it enters this symbol. This is known as the infinite sum symbol. symbol. <laughs> the infinite sum symbol, which is also how we integrate an infinite numbers of windows of time or a differential. So we can take this same concept and now we've got an infinite number of tr uh, rectangles and we represent it like this. We have the infinite sum or the antiderivative and we have the function of x which is the height of you know each individual rectangle or your know, rectangle and then we've got this differential of time that we're concerned with. And that is what's going to equal our distance, or give us a function that represents the distance. 
And the way you utilize this is you would take your original function and your differential in time, and when you would take add one to the the exponent, and then divide by that new exponent. So x raised to the n, and then to antiderivative would be x raised to the n plus one divided by uh, n plus one. And this is true so long as n does not equal negative one. So if we were to apply this same rule, this whole antiderivative rule, to this particular function here, f of x is equal to 2x, what we'd end up with is taking the antiderivative of 2x with respect to time, the differential of time, the constant 2 goes outside of the infinite sum symbol, so that doesn't get changed, and then we follow our rules, which is you add 1 to the exponent, which is 1 plus 1 equals x raised to the 2, and then divide by 2, the new exponent. The 2's cancel out, and you're left with x raised to the second power. Now, what you also notice is that I have this plus c represented here. I'll go more into that one. That's called a constant of integration. And what this tells you is that there is an entire family of functions that actually solve this particular differential or differential equation. But what you can see is that one of those functions is our original function. So we can see this is the original table that we looked at and this is the original graph of the distance over time. Now, so this is the basics of taking an antiderivative of a function. And this is Professor Cummings. In the next video, I'll go through some examples uh, to show you a little bit more how this works that we can apply to it. Again, this is Professor Cummings, and I want to thank you for watching.